Again, we are privileged to have as our teacher today Rabbi Aaron Pankin of Hebrew Union College. Aaron, it's all yours. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, this is Aaron Pankin. I'm sitting here in my office in New York, and hopefully the phone will not ring and not too many students will knock on the door as time goes by. But I'm uh, delighted to be with you this afternoon to share um, a, a, um, a presentation on a number of things that um, I've been thinking about over the past couple of years relating to um, a wonderful section of Jewish literature that really no one knows anything about. Um, what I find in my teaching at Hebrew Union College is that our students come in and they're often uh, very excited about studying Talmud, very excited about studying Midrash. They're happy to study commentaries, but they've um, never really heard of a, a time period called the Second Temple period. Here and there you get a, a wonderful student who spent some time in Jerusalem, maybe studied in a university program where they've had a bit of an exposure to it. But by and large, across, uh, across the Jewish world, there's a very small focus on this time period. And what I've learned through my graduate study and through work that I've done afterwards is that there are really some incredible uh, kinds of literature that arise during this time period. So let me define the period first historically, and um, then I'll tell you exactly what we're going to take a look at today over the course of the next hour together. Um, the period effectively is called the Second Temple Period. You might also call it refer uh, hear it referred to as the Second Commonwealth. And it's essentially the period from 587 BCE or 586 BCE with the destruction of the First Temple through the destruction of the Second Temple, which is in 70 CE. Now, um, as good Jews, we always date things from one terrible destruction to another, um, and that's, uh, that's how it goes. In fact, the old joke is that, um, you know, what is a Jewish holiday? They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. And uh, what we have here is we have a destruction in 587, 586 BCE, and another one in 70 CE. And during that intervening period, um, we have a number of fascinating historical circumstances that take place that lead to all sorts of interesting productivity. And without going into um, too much of details on this, what I'd like to say is just to, to note that the Babylonian exile, that 70-ish year period from 586 through about 520, 510 uh, BCE, um, because it took the Jews out of their Judean uh, homeland, it led to a very interesting possibility for production of literature. And in fact, um, many scholars nowadays think that that was one of the starting points for the what they call the scripturalization of the Bible, which means the turning of the Bible into something that was actually considered to be sacred scripture, um, and the idea of compiling readings uh, in a way that would become a kind of sacred literature. So that doesn't mean that it was all written then or there, but pot potentially the idea of the possibility of having a sacred scripture could possibly have begun during the Babylonian exile. Upon return from the Babylonian exile in the 510s or so, um, we then move into what's called the Persian period. The Persian period led to uh, interaction with a friendly realm, and that was a wonderful time for the Jews to do more writing and to redevelop their society. The reestablishment of the temple took place during that time period, and uh, the building of a new Jewish community in Judea on the ruins of what happened uh, before the Babylonian exile. Um, that goes on until about the 330s, when we have uh, Alexander the Great, who comes in, conquers pretty much most of the world of the Mediterranean. And from that time period basically on, we have what's called the Hellenistic period. And that goes from about 331 to um, 63 BCE, essentially, uh, well actually, sorry, through uh, 164 BCE. Um, 331 to 164 is when we have a series of um, Hellenistic, i.e. Uh, Greek-speaking rulers who rule this area. And that leads to the interesting cultural connection with the Hellenists. Um, with Greeks who were writing and thinking about Greek philosophy. And that kind of Greek philosophy creeps into Jewish ideology, into Jewish uh, literary production, uh, the arts, religion, etc. cetera. Um, in 164 BCE, the Maccabees uh, win their revolt. And from 164 to 63 BCE, we've got a time period in which basically the Maccabees are, um, Maccabees followed by the, and the Hasmoneans, are essentially the folks who are ruling this area. It's under Jewish uh, hegemony, once again, under self-rule until 63 BCE when the Romans take over, and from 63 BCE through 70 CE with the destruction of the Second Temple, um, we're in the Roman period. And the Roman period continues all the way into the 7th century. It goes on for quite a while. Um, so what I want, with this very brief overview of history, what I wanted to provide you with is the sense of the tremendous interaction that the Jewish people had with other cultures during this period. And that gives them an opportunity to learn from all of the kinds of literary production that's going on in the ancient world, and it gives them the opportunity to understand 
um, that their literary production is part of a greater kind of world culture of literary production. And so from that perspective, um, we see all sorts of interesting things start to pop up. Um, and I'll give you just a few of those in works that you may have heard of. Uh, it is, um, there are a series of Jewish novels that are written, including some that are quite romantic and quite wonderful. Um, the one you know best is probably the Book of Esther. That's a kind of mini novel, a novella, which tells the story of a wonderful young woman named Esther who saves the Jewish people. Um, there's another book uh, in what's called the Apocrypha, called Tobit, which is very similar to that in certain ways. Um, the Book of Daniel is another kind of literature. Parts of it are similar to small novels. And what we've got effectively is this kind of literary creation of novels that have arisen out of a Hellenistic context, potentially maybe a Persian context as well. Um, that's one example. Another example is the kind of legal production that takes place during this time period. And that legal production um, leads to all sorts of new expressions of Jewish law. Uh, if you try to make law by looking at the Torah, you'll find rapidly that there are a number of laws that don't always necessarily agree and might not be immediately applicable because they don't have enough data and information in the Torah. So the question is, how do you make law that can actually be applied uh, in particular circumstances? And during the Second Temple period, we start to see the beginning of laws that actually could be applied, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, we also find examples of things like poetry and um, psalms, uh, other kinds of uh, literary expression that is much more artistic and much more in the direction of um, what we might consider um, uh, art writing uh, nowadays. And, um, and that leads, in a sense, to um, all this different, this huge explosion of literary production. And so what we're going to look at today is one tiny little sliver of this literary production. And we're going to look, actually, at three texts that come from Qumran. And I want to just talk again about what Qumran is and where that is. You've heard it referred to as the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're actually going to be reading three different sections of the Dead Sea Scrolls together today. And um, before we do that, I want to give you a little bit of the historical background of Qumran. So take a look at your screen, if you would. Um, if you take a look, you can see that um, Qumran was an area, many of you, I'm sure, have been to Israel. If you've been to Israel, you've been probably to the caves, where they have a um, what my children, I, I pointed out to my children that the presentation, the little movie in there, is really kind of uh, cheesy. It's really kind of ridiculous and doesn't give a lot of very good historical information. Um, because uh, Qumran, when it was first discovered, there was a huge outcry that this might actually be um, the sect that gave rise to Jesus. And what's interesting about that is it's, it's very unlikely that that actually is the case. Um, but the movie at Qumran actually still has that ideology kind of presented, which um, I, I had a good time laughing with my children uh, last time we were there taking a look at it. Um, but take a look at the, uh, the location of Qumran. You can see that it's a little bit to the northwest of the Dead Sea. Uh, it's up in a kind of area up in the mountains where you're not far from the sea and from some water sources, but you're also not terribly far up in the mountains also. But it's a very safe and secure area. And the best thing is it's very, very dry. So the 11 caves at Qumran uh, are one of the best repositories where some of the best preserved uh, manuscripts are uh, and some great literature that we've never seen before effectively were dug up um, in, the 19, in the late 1940s and 50s. Um, I will also point out to you something people don't think about much, but if you look down the western shore of the Dead Sea, there's the Morabat, which is Bar Kokhba's caves, Ein Gedi, and Nachal Khever. These are um, other caves that were used by small groups of people probably hiding during the Bar Kokhba revolt, 132 to 135 CE, so later than Qumran, uh, or around the time that Qumran was there. Uh, but what's interesting about this is this shows also that there, were, uh, there may have been more than one area where certain um, texts were stored and things were found. Uh, let's move on to the next. Here's a picture of some of the caves of Qumran. One of the things you can see is that they're not easily accessible. Um, you would have to actually climb pretty high to be able to get into these caves. And um, that, again, is another way that preserved these texts, because otherwise, if you didn't actually uh, put them in a safe place where no one could get to, it would be very likely that they would be stolen or vandalized over the course of many, many centuries. Um, here's a closer in map of the Qumran site. And you can see that there are 11 caves. Um, cave 1, and by the way, the numbering system just simply means that Cave 1 was the first cave that was discovered. I'll tell you how that happened in a few moments. Uh, cave 2 is second and out through Cave 11. Okay, And you can see that there's kind of a, a white area running through the caves. This is kind of a rift of lowered land. And then there's kind of um, a... Uh, uh, a ridge on either side, and the caves are kind of stuck into that ridge. Um, you'll also notice two other things. In the middle, it says Kirbet Qumran, which is an Arabic word for the ruin of Qumran. 
probably a small Arab village for a while at some point in, uh, in the, probably during the Ottoman period or something like that. Uh, and then there is a cemetery there, and that's actually a very interesting thing that has um, some interesting implications for the history of this, uh, of this area. So the discovery timeline goes like this, uh, and here's where it gets fancy in my PowerPoint. In 1946 to 47, uh, a group of Bedouins find the cave. There's a, an old story, which I think is probably true, which is that there was a young Bedouin boy who was out walking uh, with his flock, and he was throwing rocks, as young boys are wont to do. And eventually, he threw a rock into a cave, into an opening in the, in the, uh, in the, cl um, in the cliff face. And um, you know, you throw a rock, throw a rock long enough, uh, you know what a rock sounds like when it lands. But in this case, he threw it in, and the rock made a kind of chink that was the sound of the rock hitting pottery. And that actually meant that um, there was something valuable inside the cave. And so he sort of tied his sheep or his goats up, and he climbed up in there. And when he went inside, he found a whole series of um, pots with certain scrolls in them. So he liberated one or two of those. And uh, four of them eventually, by March 1947, were brought um, and sold to the Metropolitan Samuel. Samuel is the name. Metropolitan is a kind of rank uh, from the Syrian Church of St. Mark. And effectively, um, this was a way of kind of getting these out here to see if they might be sold. Because the whole point of finding ancient texts for Bedouins is to uh, turn them into some possible cash. So in 1947, um, these souls were these scrolls were sold, and um, from that point on, in 1947 in November, Eliezer Sukhanik, who was from the Hebrew University, um, made a secret trip to go and purchase some of these scrolls in Bethlehem, and he got um, he. Th this was the first time that an academic had really gotten his hands on the uh, on the scrolls, and he began the process of trying to interpret where they were from and how old they were and all that. Um, the original text found in Cave 1 included the following, two Isaiah scrolls, a full copy of the book of Isaiah, and also a partial copy. Uh, the book of Habakkuk, which is uh, one of the minor prophets, there was something found called Pesher Habakkuk, which is kind of a, an early midrash almost on the book of Habakkuk. And it's a kind of midrash that actually really has never been found in any other place. And there are a number of examples of it from Qumran. So that was very exciting because this was one of the first layers of interpretation of a biblical book that had ever been seen. Um, from Qumran. Something else called the Genesis Apocryphon. An Apocryphon is a scroll that's been hidden away. And this is actually a commentary in the book of Genesis. We're going to actually take a look at a, at a sample from the Genesis Apocryphon in a couple of minutes. Um, and you'll see that this, too, is a kind of early commentary, early midrash, potentially. But it has a lot of very interesting information. It takes a lot of freedom um, with its interpretation. And so this was a very interesting find, because we have not found anything like this before. Another book, Serach HaYachad, called the Manual of Discipline. Um, this is basically something we'll look at as well. This is essentially a listing of how the sect was to work and what they were to do. And uh, it has what we'll look at in a few moments, um, uh, almost a Robert's Rules of Order for sect meetings, which is very interesting and kind of fascinating to read. The War Scroll is a scroll that talks about um, a war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, a kind of apocalyptic end of days vision of um, the folks in Qumran, this little group that may have broken off. Um, fighting everybody else and winning. And then the Hodayot are the Thanksgiving Psalms. So these are very interesting kind of new Psalms that have never been found before. In fact, in the Bible, we have 150 Psalms. One of the things they found at Qumran was Psalm 151. Uh, and there are a number of other, um, other Syriac Psalms that are actually 151 through 155. But this is the only one that's been found in Hebrew in one, uh, Psalm 151. The discovery timeline continues. Uh, in 1948, G.L. Harding of the Jordanian Antiquities Authority starts um, the Jordanian Arab League looking for the scrolls to try to get them. Remember that at this point, um, Qumran is actually really uh, part, it's, it's close to the border, but not far from Jordan, and actually in Jordan in, in many cases. So um, there's a whole question of who is allowed to get in there and, and, uh, and work on it. In 1949, Harding authorizes Roland DeVoe, who's a very famous archaeologist, to survey Cave 1 and they recover hundreds of more fragments. Um, the Metropolitan Samuel uh, takes those four scrolls that we talked about before. He brings them to the US to raise money for the Palestinians and places an ad in the Wall Street Journal under the miscellaneous sales column because he'd like to sell the scrolls to be able to give money for the Palestinian cause. Um, in 1952, Bedouin find 30 more fragments of other scrolls in Cave 2, including the Book of Jubilees and Ben Sira in Hebrew, which we'd never had before. 
And then DeVoe finds cave four with 15,000 fragments and eventually caves five and six. Um, 1953, very interesting piece of the history, and we won't spend a huge amount of time on the history, but a very interesting piece of the history is that Harding assembles a team of eight scholars with no Israelis and no Jews involved. And uh, Roland DeVoe, again, a famous archaeologist as the project director. Um, and what's fascinating about this is this set up a kind of hold on the text, on the scrolls, that was not broken for many, many years, really until 1991. And I'll talk about how that was done in a second. In 54 and 55, Yigal Yadin, the son of Eliezer Sukhanek, um, asks Professor Harry M. Orlinsky, my Bible professor from Hebrew Union College, to pose as Mr. Green and meet the Metropolitan Samuel in a bank vault, and he covertly buys four scrolls for $250,000 and returns them to Israel. So that is how some of the scrolls got back to Israel. Um, in 55 and 56, more caves up to 10 and 11 are found by the archaeologists and the Bedouin. In 58, DeVoe completes the excavations at Kirbet Qumran, and in 1965, the Shrine of the Book opens in Jerusalem with the documents from Cave 1. So if you'd like to go see the first documents that were found at Qumran, you actually just go to the Shrine of the Book, the very wonderful white building that looks, uh, my children immediately said that it looked like a plunger, uh, which is quite funny. I never thought of it that way before. But um, that building, that beautiful building in Jerusalem, houses all of the Cave 1 documents, all the ones that were found in the first set of finds at Qumran. Um, and here, by the way, is from uh, 1948 the actual first notice of um, the finding of the scrolls in the New York Times. Ten ancient scrolls found in Palestine. Books of Isaiah and Daniel are among the ten items in Hebrew written about A.D. 70. Now, um, one other thing to point out. We imagine that the Bible is a very old text, and we imagine that we have old copies of it. But the truth is, the oldest copies of the Bible we have are about 8th century, um, until Qumran. So these are the oldest, oldest texts ever found that are the biblical texts in Qumran. And what's interesting about that is that we actually find different readings in certain cases that differ from what the Masoretic tradition, the kind of uh, text that goes in the Plot Commentary and all the other printed Bibles, there actually are some significant differences. So that was a very important piece of the find. And that's why when it's announced, the books of Isaiah and Daniel, um, those are some of the most interesting finds, the biblical text in Qumran. OK, so from discovery to publication. Um, we. People, the scholars, those eight scholars, started to publish uh, Cave One discoveries in a, in a set of books called DJD, Discoveries in the Judean Desert. And the last one was completed in 2002. So that means, by the way, from 1948 or so through 2002, it took over 50 years to publish these books um, to get all the texts out. Roland DeVoe finishes ex excavating in 1956, but he never publishes the complete findings and they still remain unpublished. So there's no archaeological report from Qumran even until this day. And in 1967, during the Six-Day War, Israel gains access to Qumran, right? That becomes part of, uh, of the territory that Israel occupies. Um, and the Rockefeller Museum and all its scrolls all become part of the Israel collection, basically, because of the Six-Day War. So that opens it up to a whole group of Israeli archaeologists, but not entirely. And here's what happens. Um, in uh, this group of Christian, mostly Dominican scholars, still hold on to all these texts. They withhold publication of many critical ones for years. And as scholars die, they replace them with others in this limited group with strictly controlled access. So that means that all of the texts are not published. Some of them are, but all of them are not published for really 45 to 50 years after the texts are found. This leads to some frustration building up, especially among Jewish scholars. And that eventually leads to a breakthrough. And how does that breakthrough happen? Well. In 1989, Ben Sion Wachholder, also of HUCJIR, is granted permission to publish a copy of the Temple Scroll. And he then receives photos and an unpublished 30-year-old concordance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that means that he gets a copy of all the photos of the Temple Scroll, and he gets a concordance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you've ever used a concordance, what a concordance is is it's a list of all the different book words in a book in order. And it'll say, for example, Bereshit appears in Genesis 1. Then it'll go on to the next word, and it'll show all the places in the Bible that it, it occurs. So here, a concordance of the Dead Sea Scrolls gives the whole list of all the words used in all the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it doesn't give them an order, and it doesn't give them, um, it just simply gives a list and then where it occurs. So fascinatingly, um, Ben Sion Wachholder and Robert Eisenman both are, inter are interested in opening up access to the scrolls. He, Robert Eisenman from Cal State in Long Beach requests the scrolls, and he's denied. So some Israelis with access to the scrolls begin to send him unauthorized copies. 
This is happening right about the same time, 1989 through 1991. And in 1989 through 91, Wachholder's student, Martin Abegg, he reverse engineers the concordance into a full set of texts, which leads to opening the Huntington Library's microfiche version of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the final opening of all the texts to all scholars. So two things happen. He takes a concordance, he runs it through a computer program, and he recreates all the texts by basically looking at the list of words in each verse and then writing them out in the order he thinks it was it should have been. So that's kind of a fascinating pro process, and obviously there were some challenges. It's not so easy to do that, but the point is um, this opened up the possibility that anyone could then read the Dead Sea Scrolls. The other piece then is that the Huntington Library's microfiche version, these are actually photos of the Dead Sea Scrolls, are then released because the Huntington Library said enough is enough and they released it as well. So the combination of those two things really allowed um, the Dead Sea Scrolls to eventually be published. And um, uh, Eisenman and uh, Wachholder and Abegg were really the people who allowed this to happen and, and moved them uh, in a most positive direction so that everyone could see the Dead Sea Scrolls. So quickly, what was found at Qumran? Well, we've got biblical text, 29%. Interestingly, it includes sections of all biblical texts except Esther. We've got Second Temple Literature, the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. These are works that uh, I like to call the B-list of the Bible, things that never made it into the Bible but were written around the same time period. We've got sectarian literature, new material we have from no other place, which includes customs and regulations, liturgical compositions, eschatological texts, texts that talk about what happens in the end of days. And then there's 13% of the material at Qumran that's either too fragmentary or unidentified. We just don't know what it is. All right? Um, we're going to look today at things only from the section called sectarian literature, so you see uh, what's going on there. Um, I'm going to skip through the archaeology here time-wise so that we have, um, uh, actually we'll look at one last slide here in the archaeology of Qumran II. Um, there's a great question as to what Qumran is. Some people suggest it was a residence or a villa. Other people say it was a fort. Other people say it was a sect hideaway, and you have to be careful how you say that so it's interpreted correctly, but the hideaway for a sect of breakaway Jews. Some people see it as a library, which is why all the texts would be there, but again, that's interesting because it means that if the text is there, it might just be in the library. It might not represent the viewpoint of the sect, so that's an interesting kind of challenging position. And the other people, others suggest that it might have been a copying place, as I like to call it, a kinkos, which would essentially be a place where people brought their scrolls to be copied. Um, and there's some convincing evidence on that from little tables that appear to be places where scribes could have written that were found in Qumran. Um, we'll skip through this key sectarian uh, literature, and I want to show you also the Qumran storage jars. This is the kind of jars that texts would have been stored in. Here's an example of the Ten Commandments from Qumran, from a biblical text. The Book of Psalms, actually. Uh, and you see down at the bottom a very challenging part of reading Qumran texts is that their things are fragmentary. Uh, even though they were very well preserved, there was still some uh, decay that happened along the bottoms and the tops of, uh, of text, and that made it a little challenging. Here's an example of the War of Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness. You can see the beautiful uh, ancient Hebrew here, um, which is very similar to our Hebrew. We can read it pretty much straight out, um, but, you know, again, uh, very fragmentary. The Temple Scroll, telling about what the ideal temple should look like. Um, the Copper Scroll, a wonderful, interesting example of... Um, a kind of treasure map in the ancient world. And um, this last slide is actually not where we're going to go now. We're going to actually move on to, um, to a PDF, which I'm going to bring up on your screen in just a second. So if you will hang on for a second, that should hang on. There we go. OK. And would now be a good time for people to type in questions? Now, now, would be an, now would be an excellent time now that we've introduced Qumran for some questions. So let me do that, and I'll bring that new, next screen up in just a second. Also, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, I'll unmute you. Can everyone see the PDF right now? or? Not yet. Not yet, OK. Oh, I see. Hang on. Here we go. That should do it. Everybody see it now? Go ahead and hit play one more time. Play. There we yeah. go. Perfect. You got it? Okay. There we go. Very good. Okay, any questions before we move on? Okay. So um, we'll take a quick look then at a couple of texts here now that um, relate to... Um, that oh, wait a minute, Aaron. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. It just come in. Okay, what go most important finding or scroll from 
Qumran? Okay. Um, well, I think you know the truth is there'd be a big debate about that, um, and um, I, I would say uh, some people would say that the biblical text, because they're so much earlier and they're so exciting, and it gives us early readings of biblical work. Um, certainly, biblicists will say that. My personal favorite, I would have to say, is some of the um, some of the material that deals with early Jewish law. And I'll show you, for example, a section that deals with um, some Shabbat laws, because it really gives you almost a um, a kind of uh, a, an early, a window into early text that led to the creation of the Mishnah and the Talmud. Um, so it shows what, what I love about the, the material in this time period is it shows the kind of connection between Bible and Mishnah and Talmud and kind of how that material grew. That it didn't all just happen in the Mishnah, but actually there was this moment of you know five six hundred years where there was an ongoing development. So I think that's quite quite important. And the other the one last thing I would say is um, some of the interpretive material. What we're going to read right now. I think is very, very important because it also shows this kind of um, this continuity, this uh, this trend line of change and development in the way um, writing takes place in a Jewish community. So thank you for that question. Okay, and any another other? one. Okay. Uh, any guesses as to why all the Bible is reproduced except Esther? Yes, um, a, there's a there's a guess, but there's actually a huge debate about this. Um, Esther, interestingly enough, is um, there. There are some rabbinic texts even in the second and third century CE that don't necessarily include the book of Esther in what's called the canon. And they don't actually use the word canon, so it's not clearly um, defined this way. But basically what it says is if, the, if um, the, way, the way the conversation goes is if books are burning uh, in a house on Shabbat, and since you're not allowed to go into a house and carry things out on Shabbat, what books do you save? And there's a whole question as to whether or not the book of Esther would be included in the list of books that you save. If it's not included in that list, then it wouldn't be considered part of the canon. And so, therefore, there's a question as to whether Esther is canonized. Um, and you know, so so I think there is probably a question as to whether or not Esther was included. Now, the only problem is, of course, it might be that Esther just didn't make it for you know a more mundane reason. So it's hard to read. You don't want to read too much out of something you know in a negative manner, the way uh, the way that would suggest. So people are very careful about that, and they they can suggest and speculate. But unfortunately, there's really just not enough proof to know why that is. It could just could just have been a mistake that it just didn't show up there. Just an aside, because this isn't really a question for you, Aaron. Uh, it was requested that we send the pa the PDFs to everybody who was on, so we will do that after this presentation. It, okay. Just as a, as a side note, the PDF will be available in our archives online as well. And you know what we'll do? We'll we'll print one and put it into a. Um, a Qumran container also, so it'll stay around for a couple thousand years, so that'll be good. Okay, so let's take a quick look at um, a biblical text and its interpretation in Qumran. And this is a biblical text you may well be familiar with because it's a very common text to read. Um, there are two instances um, in the book of Genesis where a famine drives Aram and Sarai down to Egypt. And we're going to look at one and its interpretation. So this is Genesis 12, 10 through 20. And the Hebrew is above for you to take a look at if you'd like to follow in the Hebrew. I'm just going to read the English. If you have questions about the particular uh, issues in Hebrew, please don't hesitate. But, um, but let me just read this, and uh, we'll see how the story goes, and then we'll see what the story, what's done with the story as we move into the literature from Qumran. So, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. If the Egyptians see you and think she is his wife, they will kill me and let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that I may remain alive thanks to you. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw how very beautiful the woman was. Pharaoh's courtiers saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's palace. And because of her, it went well with Abram. He acquired sheep, oxen, asses, male and female slaves, she-asses, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his household with mighty plagues on account of Sarai, the wife of Abram. Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her as my wife? Now here is your wife. Take her and be gone. And Pharaoh put men in charge of him, and they sent him off with his wife and all that he possessed. Now, this biblical text is an interesting biblical text for a number of reasons. Um, we could point out, for example, um, that we've got a couple of problems with the way Avram behaves. And actually, I don't know if this will work, actually, but could we use the, um, could we use the question feature? Let's type in, if you would, 
what questions does this text actually raise for you as we read it? Um, anything in there that you notice that makes you want to really ask a question about this text? Can we try that? Let's see how it goes. Yeah. So type with abandon. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Good, okay. Yes. I see a lot of good questions. We, yeah, we got a few coming in. Okay, so let's, uh, let me just run through these questions. These are great questions already. Um, number one, does this foresee the later plagues of the Egyptians? Now, interestingly, um, the relationship here between Avram and the Egyptians um, does set up a kind of tortured relationship with Pharaoh. And this may be, in a sense, a kind of foreshadowing of what comes along later. Great question. Why did Sarai go along with this? Right. So Avram asks her effectively to lie. Um, he then asks her effectively to lie with Pharaoh, right? It, it implies in the story that Pharaoh takes her into his palace. Um, and once that happens, it's pretty clear from the story, though it doesn't say it directly, it's pretty clear that something's going on in terms of a relationship between Pharaoh and Sarai. That would be called ni'uf in other parts of the Bible, or adultery. So there's really something wrong with this idea of, um, of Sarai doing this, okay? Next, um, was Avram being compassionate or self-serving, right? Avram may be compassionate to try to protect Sarai and himself, but he also could be self-serving because he wants to put himself in a position where he's going to curry favor with Pharaoh. Great. Doesn't this reflect our human nature? Wow. Okay, so... Um, our human nature may be to lie to protect ourselves. Is that maybe what that means? But um, I'm not sure exactly how to take that question in terms of our human nature. Um, what is this? Okay, good. So let me point out just a few other quick things that, um, that come about in this text, and then we'll move on to an interesting interpretation of it. So there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to sojourn in Egypt. And going down to sojourn in Egypt for a famine is a very common thing. We see that with the story of Joseph, remember, um, and we see that often. Uh, so the lying here about Sarai being his sister is meant to protect him and Sarai. Um, we have the stress on Sarai's beauty. Um, we have Pharaoh's courtiers who form a little kind of Greek chorus who see her and tell Pharaoh how beautiful she is. And Avram seems to do very well because of um, his relationship with Pharaoh. He gets all sorts of property. But then God steps in and afflicts Pharaoh and his household with mighty plagues. So it's interesting that Pharaoh, who, by the way, didn't know he was doing anything wrong, he ends up with the punishment. So it's, it's quite a problem that Avram dreams this up, and then Pharaoh ends up getting published for, uh, punished for what Avram does. Finally, Pharaoh sends for Avram. He says, what is this you've done to me? Why didn't you tell me? Why did you say she's your wife, or she's your sister, rather? And Pharaoh puts men in charge of him, and they sent him off with his wife and all that he possessed. So he takes all of the possessions with him. And he goes, and uh, Pharaoh gives him a, a kind of nasty send-off from Egypt. So now my question is, why would Avram do this? What's the point of his doing this? Why does he think it's okay? Um, and this story raises a whole series of very interesting challenges on the character of Avram, on the character of Sarai for going along with it, and the whole question of why our patriarchs and matriarchs, some of our most important people, would actually do something like this. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the um, let's take a quick look at the next part of the text here. This is a Genesis apocryphon, as I mentioned before. Um, if you look at the top, it says one Q, meaning the first cave in Qumran, Ap Gen, the apocryphon, the hidden scroll of Genesis, R means Aramaic, and this is columns 19 through 20 uh, through 20. All right. So now we're going to take a look, actually, starting at line 10 in column 19, uh, and I'll read. And as I read, try to think what problems this text is actually trying to solve, because it's quite fascinating what it does. Now, there was a famine in all that land, but I heard that in Egypt there was grain. So notice immediately, this is Avram speaking in the first person. And what's fascinating about the Genesis Apocryphon is we get into the minds of the characters um, through a first person kind of, kind of lens, which to me is an indication of some other kind of influence on this writing, because you don't see a lot of first person writing in biblical history uh, and biblical texts. Only later on do you start to get to this. So this is probably something picked up from Persian or potentially Greek uh, influence. So I journeyed to enter the land of Egypt, and I reached the Carmon River, one of the branches of the Nile. Until this point, we were still within our own land, but now I crossed the seven branches of this river that dot, dot, dot. And now you see one of the problems in Qumran is that the fragmentary edges of things sometimes come off. So we don't know how verse 12 ends. Anything that's in brackets is either a restoration or a hole that we can't really fill. 
So we do our best, but luckily this is a relatively complete text. So line 13, now we had crossed our land and entered the land of the children of Ham, the land of Egypt. I, Abram, had a dream the night of my entry into the land of Egypt. In my dream I saw a cedar tree and a date palm growing from a single root. Then people came intending to cut down and uproot the cedar, thereby to leave the date palm by itself. The date palm, however, objected and said, do not cut the cedar down, for the two of us grow, sorry, do not cut the cedar down, for the two of us grow from but a single root. So the cedar was spared because of the date palm and was not cut down. Now the word vacat just means an empty space. It's actually the Latin word uh, connected to the word vacation in English. It's an empty space. Uh, then I started from my sleep while it was still night and said to Sarai, my wife, I've had a dream and now am fearful because of it. She replied, tell me your dream so I may understand. So I began to explain it to her and I also explained its significance. I said, men will come intending to kill me while sparing you. Notwithstanding, this is the kindness that you can do for me. In every place where we shall go, say concerning me, he is my brother. Thus I may live because of you and my life be spared owing to you. They will attempt to separate us and to kill me. Then Sarai wept at my words that night. And the pharaoh of Zoan, that's the name of a pharaoh that's actually used in the other Genesis passage like this, Sarai no longer wanted to go to Zoan with me, for she was exceedingly careful lest any man should see her for five years. Nevertheless, after five years had passed, three men of the princes of Egypt came from Pharaoh Zoan on account of my words and of my wife. They gave me many gifts. They asked me for knowledge of goodness, wisdom, and righteousness. So I read to them the book of the words of Enoch in the famine, etc. And now we have a big sort of chunk that's left out at the bottom uh, of this column, and then we move on a little bit farther into the story. What I want to point out to you about what's happened so far is the following. I mentioned the first-person uh, viewpoint, the first-person perspective in this story. Um, notice what's happened with the command to go down to Egypt. How is it that Avram comes around to the idea of going down to Egypt and to lying about his wife and having his wife lie on his behalf? Well, it comes from a dream. And what this text has now done is this text has now taken the responsibility for this idea off of Avram, and it has now placed it instead onto the dream. The dream is, in the ancient world, direct communication from God. So this palm tree, date tree dream is all about the idea, I'm sorry, palm tree and cedar tree is all about the idea of taking responsibility from Avram and putting it in the hands of God. God has now asked Avram through the message included in this dream to be sure that he has Sarah lie and protect the two of them. So what's happened is instead of Avram being self-serving, instead of Avram just trying to protect himself, instead of Avram being in a position where he is responsible for this action, it is now God's responsibility and God is having a direct hand in history and making sure that Avram and Sarai are okay. So this has now validated the action of Avram and given him permission, in fact a command from God, to behave in this way. And therefore, if we were concerned about the character of our patriarch, we now can feel a lot better thanks to the Genesis Apocryphon. All right, let's read on a little bit more and we'll see some of the other things that happened here. Before you move on, there's a question. Go for it. Do these two trees from a single root eventually point to Jews and Muslims? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think that there's um, an idea. First of all, this text wasn't found again until 1948 or so, or a little bit later than that even. So I, I doubt that this has been interpreted that way. Um, uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that actually would apply. This is a much, much more ancient text. We're talking about 800 to 1,000 years before uh, Islam is ever established. So someone could do that now, certainly, but I don't, I don't think that would have been done during this time period. And another one is, um, are there other Midrash that also make this point? Uh, there are later Midrashim that, that don't do it exactly the same way, but there are things that approach here and there, some of the things in the Genesis Apocryphon. Yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me make one other comment. Down in line 25, I just want to mention to you the book of the words of Enoch. Enoch was supposed to be a a tremendous character who went up to heaven. He had what was called an apocalypse, um, where he's lifted up by angels and taken to heaven, and he gets to read all this fascinating wisdom. So here, uh, the book of Enoch is being shared as sort of special wisdom that the Jews have that nobody else has. And he is then sharing it with the people from uh, Pharaoh's court. Let's go into column 20, and I want you to now uh, understand, we, we knew that Sarai was beautiful, but I want you to hear what the Genesis Apocryphon says to her. And, and if you're under 18, I'd ask you actually to, to uh, turn off your website. No, I'm teasing. It's not quite like that, but it's quite, it's, quite a, uh, it's quite a picture here. So line two in column 20. 
How and beautiful is the aspect of her face, and how pleasant and how supple is the hair of her head. How lovely are her eyes, how pleasant her nose, and all the radiance of her face. How shapely is her breast, how gorgeous all her fairness. Her arms, how comely. Her hands, how perfect. How lovely is every aspect of her hands. How exquisite are her palms, how long and delicate all her fingers. Her feet, how attractive. How perfect are her thighs. Neither virgins nor brides entering the bridal chamber exceed her charms. Over all, woman is her, over all women is her beauty supreme, her loveliness far above them all. Yet with all this comeliness she possesses great wisdom, and all that she has is beautiful. So this is now the report, we, as we read on, of a person named Hyrcanus who is telling Pharaoh about her. So we go on in line 8. When the king heard Hyrcanus' words and those of his companions, for the three of them spoke of one accord, he desired her very much. So he sent immediately and had her brought to him. He saw her and was amazed at her beauty. Thereupon he took her as his wife and sought to kill me. But Sarai said to the king, He is my brother. Thus she benefited me and I was spared. I, Abram, by her good graces, am not killed. Then I wept copiously. I, Abram, both I and Lot, my nephew, that night when Sarai was taken from me by force. So notice Pharaoh is taking her by force. Notice also how the story has focused on her incredible beauty and gone far beyond the description of her just being beautiful, but described various parts of her body and even her wisdom um, clearly, uh, this text is embellishing on what the biblical text has suggested, um, which does a couple of things. It praises our, pa our matriarch, um, and, and I guess by default then also our patriarch, and it also um, makes clear that she was you know, completely desirable to Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh takes her by force, as opposed to uh, her going by herself. Um, so it's, Pharaoh is put in a much more difficult, um, damaging kind of role here than he was in the biblical text. Let's go on to line 12. Um, so now we're going to get to what happens with Abram and Pharaoh and everything. And I think you'll see a very surprising outcome here of uh, what you think might happen with Pharaoh and Sarai. But luckily, when you read this text, everything comes out a little bit differently. So that night I prayed, this is Abram, entreating and seeking mercy. In anguish, tears running down my cheeks, I said, Blessed are you, O God, most high, eternal Lord, for you are Lord and master over all. Over all the kings of the earth, you are Lord, to work justice among them. And now I seek redress, O Lord, against the Pharaoh of Zoan, king of Egypt, for my wife has been taken from me by force. Render me a verdict against him and display your mighty hand against him and all his house. May he not be empowered this night to defile my wife. Thus they may know you, O my Lord, that you are Lord over all the kings of the earth. So I wept and spoke to no one. So now I spoke to none. Um, Avram here is praying, and um, the inclusion of his prayer to God is actually another element that we start to see in Second Temple literature that never really existed very much before, though there are small occasions of it. Um, and you can see that he has a very serious prayer asking God to intervene in this terrible situation. So I wept and spoke to none. That night God Most High sent a baneful spirit to smite him and every man of his household, an evil spirit that continued to afflict him and every man of his household. Consequently, he, being Pharaoh, was unable to have sexual relations with her. Indeed, he did not have intercourse with her, even though she was with him two full years. And at the end of two years, the plagues and afflictions grew yet more severe against him and every man of his household. So he sent messengers calling for all the wise men of Egypt, along with all the magicians and healers of Egypt, thinking that perhaps they could cure him and his household of this pestilence. Yet none of the healers, magicians, and wise men were able to cure him. On the contrary, the spirit afflicted all of them, too, so that they fled. So you can see uh, here, God responds to Abram's prayer. God prevents sexual intercourse between Pharaoh and Sarai, uh, which is fascinating because the biblical story, there's no question, it leaves the opportunity for us to interpret that. But I don't think that's the simple, straightforward meaning of the biblical text in any way, shape, or form. So here, the, uh, the author of this text is trying to interpret around the problem of Sarai having intercourse with Pharaoh, which is definitely a problem for our view of our matriarch, and clearly for the relationship between Avram and Sarai. And here, the last thing I would point out in verses or lines 18 through 21, we've got this fascinating scene which is reminiscent of all the magicians and healers of Egypt in the time of uh, Moses. When Moses is uh, doing the plagues and showing off all the miracles God can do, um, the Egyptian courtiers, the magicians are trying their best, but they can't keep up with them. And here, that um, section from the book of Exodus clearly is influencing the, the Genesis Apocrypha on this text we're reading um, right here as well. So let's see what happens. In line 21, Then Hyrcanus came to me, asking me to come pray for the king, and to lay hands upon him and cure him, for he had seen me in a dream. 
But Lot replied, My uncle Abram is unable to pray for the king while Sarai, his wife, remains with him. Now go tell the king to send his wife to her husband. Then he will pray for him and he will be cured. When Hyrcanus heard Lot's words, he went and told the king, All these smitings and plagues by which my lord the king has been smitten and afflicted are because of Sarai, the wife of Abram. Let him return Sarai to Abram, her husband, and this plague will depart from you. That is the spirit causing the discharges of pus. Just in case you weren't sure what was going on, that clears it all up. So he called me to himself and asked me, What have you done to me because of your wife Sarai? You told me she is my sister, yet she was actually your wife. I took her as my own wife. Here she is. Take her. Go. Depart from all the provinces of Egypt. But first pray for me and my house that this evil spirit may be exercised from us. So I prayed for him, that blasphemer, and laid my hands upon his head. Oh, by the way, the screaming you hear here is probably part of the New York Giants parade that's going to be coming down uh, Broadway in a few minutes. So hopefully we'll be done before they get here. Um, so, uh, but first pray for me. So I prayed for him, that blasphemer, and laid my hands upon his head. Thereupon the plague was removed from him, the evil spirit exercised from him, and he was healed. The king rose and gave me on that day many presents, and the king swore to me with an oath that he had not touched her. Then he returned her to me. And the end here is that he receives a whole series of different parting gifts from the king, silver and gold, quantities of linen and purple dyed garments. These are all signs of royalty. And um, also all the things that he got according to the biblical passages. Uh, and the point here is basically that because Avram has prayed for the healing of the Pharaoh, it makes sense that Pharaoh would give him a gift. So that also explains why Avram, when he's run out of Egypt, actually gets to take some parting gifts with him as well. So to sum up uh, this section, what I'd like to say is that we've got a very creative rereading of this story, which solves a whole series of very important problems. The character of Avram and Sarai, what Pharaoh and Sarai might have done, the idea that God is responsible for this manipulation of history as opposed to Avram, um, and ultimately uh, some of the other smaller problems in this uh, in terms of understanding um, what it meant uh, the plagues, the different kinds of things that happened to Pharaoh, and why at the end Pharaoh actually gives Avram certain things to take with him. So I think we'll stop there for a second and see if there are any other questions on this passage before we uh, we move on. So let's let's take a break for questions. And Aaron, you've got about ten minutes. I am aware of that. Okay. Okay. Questions or comments? Anything else you'd like to add? Okay. All right. Then uh, in that case, let us let's move on to. Um, we're going to actually skip the middle document. We're going to go to the last document because there's something real fun in there. We'll take a look at that. The middle document. I'll just give it to you so you can read at home. Basically, what it has is it's got um, starting here with the Damascus document CDA. That's French for Covenant du Damasque. Um, that's the uh, that's essentially a document that is one of the first collections of Sabbath laws that we've ever seen. Um, one of the things that people often think is that Shabbat has always been the way it's been, and the truth is that Shabbat underwent tremendous and dramatic development over the course of history. Uh, and fascinating here is these are some of the first laws that we ever have written in a collection of Shabbat, and they very much resemble a sort of proto-Mishnah, an early form of the Mishnah that, um, that comes about two to three hundred years later. But uh, we'll say that, yeah? When you started talking, two more comments came in. Okay, two more comments. Go ahead. Praise. He assigned men to escort me out of Egypt gives a very different light to Abram's leaving. It seems Pharaoh may be protecting Abram from other Egyptians who might be mad at Abram for the deceit. Okay. Interesting, right? Yeah. Good comment. Thank you. And then and the other is a question. Is this new outlook taken seriously as code? <laughs> Um, well, you know, the, the only problem with it not being taken seriously was that it was stuck in a container in Qumran for about 2,000 years. So I don't know that other people, uh, I don't know that other people even had a chance to look at it and analyze it, frankly. So, um, so it is likely that it wasn't taken seriously just because not many people knew it. We didn't have any other uh, versions of this text ever found until 19, you know, until the, the late 40s, early 50s. So it is, um, it is unlikely it would have been taken seriously because it just wasn't known. Now that it's out, it's a very interesting thing for people to read and share and think about. But you know, it's one of many interpretations, including later Midrashim, that, that talk about this as well. Here's another one. Um, the Abram portion, which you discussed, relates back to the Torah. Did they have the Torah in front of them when they wrote what you read? Um, yes, it is very likely that they had the Torah. Was it the whole Torah? Um, 
Probably yes, because there, there's evidence that there was a Pentateuch any time after about the 5th century, 4th century BCE. So it's very likely that everything in the Torah was already there and accessible. Uh, were all the books of the prophets and the books of the writings there? The whole Tanakh may probably had not come together by the time the Genesis Apocrypha was being written, um, but it is it is possible that it was it is it was possible if it was it was it came together recently. Um, it is also possible it hadn't yet come together. Unfortunately, you know they didn't publish a uh, they didn't publish one every couple of years and show you how it developed over time. You know you just have a very small group of texts put together that you can date as best you can, but it's very difficult to establish exactly uh, exactly when it came together. Okay, let's um, let's skip on to this last um, column. Uh, you can see on page five, and I'm just going to read you a couple of interesting things and point out some things about the rules of this sect or this community. Um, this is called, as I mentioned before, Serach Hayacha, the rule of the community. Um, other people call it the Manual of Discipline. That's another name for it. Um, and uh, this is essentially how a person becomes part of the Qumran sect. So it's really very much like a Robert's Rule of Order of how people would function during their conversations and their meetings in the sect. So as you read it, think of your synagogue board or think of you know, uh, any kind of board you might sit on or any kind of community organization you might be a part of and how it functions. Uh, and you'll see, actually, I think, some very interesting things. So line eight. So this is the rule for the session of the general membership, each man being in his proper place. So a general membership meeting was sort of a general membership meeting, similar to what we'd have in any nonprofit organization. Each man being in his proper place, everybody had a hierarchical place in which they were placed during this meeting. The priest shall sit in the first row, the elders in the second, then the rest of the people, each in his proper place. In that order, they shall be questioned about any judgment, deliberation, or matter that may come before the general membership so that each man may state his opinion to the party of the yachad. Yachad is a word that means together or collective, and this is the whole collective group. Okay. Now, here's where it gets fun. None should interrupt the words of his comrades, speaking before his brother finishes what he has to say. So interrupting people without having you recognized on the floor is unacceptable. That's very important. Uh, neither should anyone speak before another of higher rank. So higher ranking people get to go first, lower ranking people go second or third or fourth. Only the man being questioned shall speak in his turn. During the session of the general membership, no man should say anything except by the permission of the general membership, or more particularly, of the man who is the overseer of the general membership. So interestingly, there's someone named an overseer who is responsible for making sure that all of those in the general membership are kept in order, that nobody speaks in front of anybody else. This is the person who's kind of presiding over the meeting. If any man has something to say to the general membership, yet is of a lower rank than whomever is guiding the deliberations of the party of the community, let him stand up. He should then say, I have something to say to the general membership. If they permit, he may speak. Right? So here what you've got is you've got rules for meetings to make sure that people speak in the appropriate order they're supposed to speak in, that no one interrupts anyone else, etc. Very interesting piece of sort of managing a community. Um, and there's one more thing I'd like to show you today as a kind of closure is we're going to take a look at how one gets into the community. And that starts on line 13 in the second half here. So if anyone of Israel volunteers for enrollment in the party of the Yachad, the man appointed as leader of the general membership shall examine him regarding his understanding and works. If he has the potential for instruction, he is to begin initiation into the covenant, returning to the truth and repenting of all perversity. So the idea here is if anyone who is Jewish comes from the outside and wants to be part of this sect, you examine him looking at his understanding and his works, if he has the potential to become part of the sect, you can begin initiation and return to the truth. Note the language that if you are part of the sect, you're part of the truth, and everybody else is perverse and wrong, um, and then you can become part of the sect. Now, just to kind of cut to the chase here, all of this is really over the course of two years. Um, you have this examination, this checking out, making sure the person is OK. Uh, and without reading the rest, let me just sum up by saying the following, just so we can end on time. Um, the end of this piece is that essentially you've got a two-year process. The first year, you're allowed to do certain things. You're kind of an initiate um, into the sect, but you can't be fully part of the sect. And then only in the second year, after two years of study and, and examinations and making sure that everybody's OK, there's even a blackballing process. If somebody doesn't like you, you will not get into the sect. Um, then ultimately, after those two years, you can become fully part of the sect and fully part of what everyone is doing within the sect. So. Um, what I would say is that this represents, if you go to the very bottom of the page, you can see this is actually a picture of that particular piece of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you can see why reconstructing all the words is not actually always so easy. But it is 
reasonably uh, comfortable to read most of the words, but here and there you have to be a little creative. So to sum up, um, what we've seen today is that during the Second Temple period, and I'll just run back up, during the Second Temple period, we've had a variety of different expressions of Jewish literature. Um, the first, uh, this interpretive literature that interprets Bible and reads it in interesting and stark and uh, very challenging and fascinating new ways. A second is the kind of legal material, the laws of Shabbat, and bringing those laws together from all the different parts of Tanakh, all the different parts of the Bible, and putting them together in new ways that make them accessible uh, and easily understood to people. And then the third is this idea of actually forming new communal organizations, understanding how new communities work in new contexts. And some of that is the sectarian context, the context of being away from everybody else, being off in the desert by yourself, and in other cases, um, that will be the kind of thing that would actually happen in bigger cities or in other places. And we do have a number of descriptions of how communities work in the books uh, written by Josephus, Philo, in the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha as well. So, um, so to kind of close up, this is a moment of great Jewish creativity, great Jewish uh, literary production, and it's very exciting to be able to read what happens where people are starting to interpret a tradition and starting to understand what, what, can do, what one can do with it in a new context, in the context of understanding yourself as a Jew um, in a very different world as you try to reconstruct what the Jewish community is going to look like uh, after destruction and under Persian, Hellenistic, and eventually Roman rule. Um, and that leads to a tremendous amount of creativity and some very exciting writings. And uh, ultimately, I think it does represent um, one of the most important periods of Jewish creation simply because of all the disruption or all the challenges that are faced. And, my only modern comment in closing, and I'm happy to stick around and take questions as long as everyone would like, my only modern comment is to say that sometimes when systems and worlds get disrupted, um, it's a very wonderful opportunity for people to come up with very creative, very exciting new kinds of uh, productivity and new kinds of uh, creation. So I hope that will also be true in our own modern world. So let me stop there and uh, see if there are any questions or comments anyone would like to make. Thank you very much for joining us. One comment that has come in, um, to, I should say, they're pointing out that there's currently an exhibit of Dead Sea Scrolls here in New York, and the question is, will if somebody were to go to that exhibit, would they see any of the materials you discussed? And that, of course, depends on whether you've been there yet or not. That's right. I have not actually been there. Um, I've heard sort of good and sort of mixed reviews of that. Um, you know, it certainly is always, I, I would never say it's bad to see the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think it's always terrific to go see them. Um, it is likely that would, there would be something that I would have mentioned. Uh, certainly some of the stuff in the slideshow um, would definitely be included um, because, you know, those are kind of the main core Dead Sea Scrolls. There might be something from Genesis Apocrypha, and I'll bet there's something probably from the, the section that I read uh, about the, um, uh, the laws of the sect as well. So it, it is likely that there would be material from these things there, for sure. Um. And if you, if, you happen, if you happen to go and you have a question, you know, please don't, don't hesitate to email me. I, I, I should hopefully be able to answer any questions and be helpful. So. Um, to another one, are these unique examples of these texts or are similar versions found in other places? Uh, good As question. Other collections of Midrashim. Yeah, good question. Um, there's, interestingly, the Genesis Apocryphon is a good example of something that recurs in a number of different ways. Um, for example, the Book of Jubilees, which is a retelling of most of the Book of Genesis, also does a lot of sort of recreation of the stories in interesting ways to get to different points. So there's there's a whole, basically a whole sort of parallel Book of Genesis that's written during this time period that is really fascinating. So I'd urge you to go find the Book of Jubilees and read it. It's really fun to read and interesting stuff. You can get it online, too. Um, and then there are Midrashim, like Breshit Rabbah, which obviously are, it's much, much later. It's a good seven, 800 years later than this material. but it includes traditions of interpretation that are really also quite fascinating. So it's, it's part of a kind of interpretive, uh, well, let, let me put it this way. One of the things that I always teach my students at HUC is that the minute um, a book becomes canonized, the minute a book becomes sacred scripture, it means that there is then the opportunity to interpret it and explain it. And so because of scripturalization, because of the idea that the Torah and eventually the Bible become scripture, um, then the process of interpretation and explanation kicks off. And so um, what we're looking at is the first slice of that process, and midrash and commentary are all later slices in that, uh, in that process as time goes by. And they're all very much connected to one another, whether orally or in written form, 
um, there's a lot of overlap and, and things that agree and disagree, you know, through the through the process of explanation over time. Um, there's a question about the exhibit in Los Angeles, whether it's at Huntington Library. I I personally have no idea. I, I don't uh, know. Hello? Any, any idea on exhibits in Los Angeles? Oh, no, I, I don't have an idea on the exhibit in Los Angeles. Um, you know, I, I, I'd be happy if somebody, if you want to just send me an email um, with information, I'd be happy to take a look at it and tell you, you know, what I think from, from looking it up online, if you like. Or, or if you'd like to fly me to Los Angeles to see it, I'd be happy to do that, too. That's okay. So, you know, just kidding. And the others were thank yous in marvelous, fascinating subject. So okay. I think we're at a good stopping point. Thank you, Very good. Aaron. I'd like... I just like to disagree with that last comment. No, I'm teasing. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank thank you very much for joining us. And can you uh, go to the last slide of the PowerPoint? I can. Hold on one second. There we go. Oh, hold on. Oh wait, I got to do it that way. One second. There we go. Go ahead and hit hit play. There we go. Perfect. There you go. Sorry I just want to invite everybody to join us on the 13th of March when the discussion will be Esther's fast and our key, her act of self-empowerment. A little bit after forum, but it'll be okay. Uh, and our teacher will be Rabbi Mar Mary Zamor, who's editor of the Sacred Tables from the CCR Press. So I hope you will join us. And registration is all up online. And have a great afternoon. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Take care.